Good morning, um, America. My name is Pastor Nelson. I'm here on the Saturday before Palm Sunday, and uh, we are going to open up in a word of prayer. We're going to pray for our, our country. We'll pray for those who have the coronavirus. We'll pray for our president and vice president as they lead us, um, that God will give them wisdom as to what they should do, the steps they should take. And uh, we just want to you know, let everyone know that God's in control. We don't need to panic. Uh, we will get through this, uh, and I truly believe God will heal, heal our land, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for all the businesses and people that are coming together as Americans to fight this virus. So let's, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we just lift up our country. In particular, we lift up the state of New York and the city of New York that are so hard hit with the coronavirus. And we ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would breathe life into the bodies of those people that are struggling with this virus, that there'd be healings. Father, we pray that a, a vaccine would be created quickly, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name that the, that the medicines that are being used would be super naturally uh, charged to bring healing to people. And Father, we pray that you would put an end to this virus, not just in America, but throughout the entire world, Father God. And Lord, we thank you that we can bring these things to you. And, and now, oh Lord, we ask that you would uh, open up the, the word of God to our hearts. May we um, see what you would have for us. Holy Spirit, show us Jesus in these passages. May we be drawn closer to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Um, our, the passage that we're in today is in Luke chapter 19, uh, beginning with verse 28 through 44. And I'd like to just read that and then get into what I believe God would have for us today. In Luke chapter 19, verse 28, it says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olive, that he sent his two disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. If anyone asks, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to them, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it, just as he said to them. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry, or cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave in, in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now this might seem like a very strange passage to some people because here you have Jesus Christ. It's Palm Sunday and he's approaching the city of Jerusalem He's getting ready to celebrate a festival with his fellow Jews. And Jesus makes a point of getting a donkey, a colt, to ride on. And so why did Jesus do this? Well, if you would turn with me in your Bibles real quick to Zechariah chapter 10, we will see why Jesus did this. In Zechariah chapter 10, I mean, excuse me, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10... This is a, a, a prophecy that was given five centuries before Jesus was born. And Zechariah the prophet said in, in Zechariah 9, verse 10, he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a, a foal of the donkey. 
Now, my friends and I have been studying the book of Zechariah, and the very first verse in Zechariah, there's a little genealogy that was given. And, and what it was is in, in Zechariah chapter 1, it says that God gave the word of the Lord to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. And for those of you who know, everything that's in the scripture is there for a reason. Jesus, you know, and the Holy Spirit has designed the word of God in such a way that every name, every number, even the, the spaces between have a purpose. And so if you study the meaning of these three names, God is giving Israel a message. Because the time of Zechariah, Israel was in a great panic as a nation. Very similar to America with this coronavirus. A little bit different because their issues were more spiritual than physical. But they were a nation that was troubled. And they were a nation that felt that God had forgotten them. And I'm sure there might be some of you out there that you think God has forgotten you. And I want you to know that that's not true. In fact, God sent Zechariah to the people of Israel for that particular time, that particular visitation. And the, the, the neat thing about the name of Zechariah is his name means Yahweh remembers. These people thought that God had forgotten them and God sends them a prophet with a name that says, I haven't forgotten you, Yahweh remembers. Not only does God give the name of the prophet, but he gives the name of his father. And his father's name is Berechiah. And Berechiah means Yahweh blesses. Because oftentimes people who have feel like they've been forgotten don't feel very blessed at all. And these people thought God had forgotten them, so they thought that God wasn't going to bless them either. But God reminds them that he hasn't forgotten them, that Yahweh remembers them, and Yahweh will bless them. Now, as human beings, we're very impatient. We want our blessings and we want it yesterday, okay? We want the goodies yesterday. And God reminds us with the third name, Edo, which means at the appointed time, that it's God's appointed time when he will bring a healing, when he will bring a blessing, even when he brought his very own son into the world. There was an appointed time. And so you can get from those three names, Yahweh remembers, Yahweh blesses, at the appointed time. And you know what, my friends? Today could be your appointed time. Now, like we just read a few minutes ago, Zechariah prophesied that the Savior of Israel, the Messiah of Israel, that God himself would come to the nation of Israel on a donkey. And you say, well, how do you know that the Messiah is God? Because if you study the Old Testament, only God could be the Messiah. Only God could save. If you read the other passages, and even here in Luke, they, what, what do the people cry out? They cry out, Hosanna, which means God save us now. There's only one person that can save a human being from death, from destruction, from uh, hell, and that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus has proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. And we're going to take a look at that for a minute. Now, I'd like to go back to the book of Luke, okay? In Luke chapter 19, I want to focus mostly on verses 41 through 44. And I want you to know that the title that I've given this message is the Palm Sunday Mishap. Because the nation of Israel made a mistake. And sometimes timing is everything, okay? I know this. God is in control and his timing is perfect. And as I've grown up in the church, as I've grown up as a Christian, as I've, as I've walked with Jesus Christ as a believer, a born again believer, I've learned that I need to make my timing consistent with the timing of God. Sometimes we run ahead of God. And sometimes we lag behind God, but what we really need to do is we need to be on the same page with God. And that's why we spend time going to church. Spending time in worship is learning to, you know, listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to our spirit, spirit to spirit. Going to church, we listen to sermons so that we can hear what God would have for us in this day because I know that the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to discern between the thought intentions of a heart. And the thing of it is this, if you love Jesus, God's word will feed you and draw you closer to him. But if you don't love Jesus, God's word might be repellent to you. You might think it's a bunch of nonsense. 
And I feel bad for those of you who feel that way because this book is the very words of life that we need for our salvation. And so my thesis to this is believers, whoever you are out there, let us cry out and declare that Jesus is God and King of the universe and that he is the answer. He is the one that's going to bring ultimate healing with this coronavirus. You know, you say, well, don't you believe in science? Yes, I do believe in science. Jesus is the one who's given us scientific knowledge. God is the one who's given us a brain. He's the one that's given us the ability to solve problems. And I believe in medicine. I believe that medicine is good. I believe hospitals are good. But I also know that people who get prayed over and who use medicine or go to the hospitals, the combination of the two, those people, have, it has been shown in studies, heal quicker and faster than those who just receive medicine alone. And so I truly believe that Jesus has the answer to our time right now. But in verse 41, we see that something very interesting, you know, in verses 28 through 40, Jesus is entering the city like a king. He's riding on a donkey. He's riding on an animal. He's, the people are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, save us now, Lord Jesus. And he rides into the city. And when he gets to the top of the hill, you see, because Jerusalem was on a mountain and, and, and the road to the center of Jerusalem, you had, you had to go uphill and stuff. And when he gets to the, to the crest of the mountain, in verse 41, it says, Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. I want you to know that Jesus is weeping over those who are suffering today. Whether it is with, with coronavirus or with the flu or with any other disease, I want you to know that Jesus cares about you and he wants to heal you. One of his names is Jehovah, our healer. And so you can, you can go to, a, you know, a pastor who believes in Jesus Christ and have them pray over you. And we have seen miracles. We've seen people healed. We've seen people delivered from cancer. We've seen people delivered from potential blindness. We've seen people delivered from colds, you know, common sicknesses. It's, it's incredible what God can do through the power of prayer. But Jesus, as he, as he gets near to Jerusalem, he weeps as he draws near to the city. And I want you to know that Jesus will draw near to you as well. Secondly, Jesus saw the city. And I want you to know that Jesus sees you wherever you are right now. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He sees you. And he hasn't forgotten you. He can bless you, but he will do it at an appointed time. Thirdly, Jesus was weeping because of the city's disbelief. You see, God gave the people of Israel a prophecy in Zechariah, but he also coupled that prophecy in Zechariah with a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Let's go to Daniel 9 real quick, shall we? Daniel 9, um, chapter 9, beginning with verse 20, we'll, we see that Daniel was a prophet of God. He was called the beloved prophet of God. He was reading his Bible. He realized that um, his, his imprisonment and captivity to the Babylonians was about to come to an end. So he starts to pray for himself, for his nation, for his family. And in verse 20, we pick up that, that, that prayer. It says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after the sixty-two weeks the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it it shall be with a flood, until the end of wars desolations are determined. And he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined and is poured out on the desolate. Now you might be saying, what in the world is that all about? Okay, well, this, this four-verse vision or prophecy that was given to Daniel is a numerical prophecy, okay? And, we'll, and I'm going to break it down for you a little bit. We, got, we need to dig a little bit into the Hebrew. The word weeks or week here comes from the Hebrew word shabuam. And what that is, that's an equivalent to, um, it's an idiom used to express a number of years, a shabuam. Now, we have an equivalent uh, expression in our culture. It, if I were to tell you, look, I need to go, but I'm going to come back in a decade, you know that I'll be gone for 10 years. Now, I didn't say 10 years. I used the, the idiom decade, which our culture has assigned the meaning of 10 years to. The, and here, this word shabuam is also an idiom for seven years, or for, uh, yeah, for, for, uh, for seven years. And so you have a prophecy that is 70 weeks of 70 years, okay? And uh, this prophecy, the, the first verse uh, gives us the scope of the prophecy. First of all, it tells us that it's a 490 year prophecy because 70 Shabuams is 70 weeks of 7 years. 7 times 70 is 490. So we know this is 490 years. Not only is it, we know the length, we know the purpose. The purpose is, uh, and, and we, we, the purpose is to finish transgression, which hasn't happened yet to make an end of sins there's still sinning going on so that hasn't happened yet to make reconciliation for iniquity that has happened Jesus has made reconciliation for our iniquity the next thing is to bring in everlasting righteousness that hasn't happened yet either because we're still on this earth and, and then the next one is to seal up vision and prophecy we, people are still receiving visions and prophecies even today. Those of you in, in the Christian world who, who think that that has come to an end, you're mistaken. There are genuine, beautiful, loving people of God that are receiving visions and prophecies even today. In fact, if you go into Ephesians, it tells us that one of the office gifts of the church is the prophet. And, and then finally, it is to anoint the most holy. Now that hasn't happened yet because there's no most holy to be finally anointed yet. The the temple of, of Jerusalem was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago and it hasn't been rebuilt. So this prophecy is an ongoing prophecy. The reconciliation for iniquity has happened, but all the rest of these prophecy, th these uh, 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 um, goals have, have yet been accomplished. The next thing we see here is that, the, that the, the focus of this prophecy is Daniel's holy city and Daniel's people. And Daniel is Jewish, so therefore his holy city is Jerusalem and his people are Jews. So the focus of this prophecy is the Jews. The focus is not the church, it's the Jews, it's Israel. Now does it involve the whole world? It does. It involves the whole world. It's going to affect the whole world, but the focus is Israel, not the church. That's important. So that's the scope of this prophecy. Then the next verse, verse 25, gives us the trigger. It says, know therefore and understand that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, the there shall be seven weeks of years and 62 weeks of years. And so if my math is correct, seven plus 62 is 69, and 69 times seven is 483 years. So obviously, this prophecy has been broken up into two parts. It's been broken up into 483 years and broken up into seven years. Interesting. That second part is seven years. And so, what is the trigger? Well, the trigger is, the, the, the street shall be, um, know therefore and understand that the going forth of the command or decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And we know the date of that trigger. 
The date of that trigger, I'm going to tell you right now, is March 14th, 445 BC, when Artaxerxes Longimanus gave Nehemiah the prophet the command or the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple of God, to rebuild the walls and the streets, and, to, and, he, and, it, was, and it was done in a time of much trouble. You see, when the Jews went back to Jerusalem, their enemies did not like the fact that they were back, excuse me, in Jerusalem, ready to rebuild the temple and re restore the worship of God. And so they would attack the Jewish people with letters to the Persian kings who were in control at this time. And so oftentimes the construction of the temple would be interrupted because the Persians would stop the Jews from building their temple because their enemies would be writing these letters saying, oh, don't let these people rebuild the city or rebuild this temple. They were once a very powerful people and you'll lose this part of your kingdom, which was ridiculous because... It's the time of the Gentiles. God was not going to let the Persian Empire at yet this time lose this part of their empire. But of course, if you don't know God, you wouldn't know that. We know that, um, the, that the date is March 14th, 445 BC, because there's the cylinder of Artaxerxes Longimanus in the Royal British Museum, and it gives us that date of March 14th, 445 BC. Okay, so now we know that the first part of the prophecy is 483 years, and scholars who have tried to take a 365-day year and times that by 483, it doesn't fit anything. In fact, it seems to be a miss, and so people have kind of ignored this. But a gentleman by the name of Sir, I, uh, Sir Robert Anderson, a former uh, head of the Scotland Yard, he did some studying, and he realized that when God is giving a prophecy in a prophetic year, a godly prophetic year, the year is not 365 days, it's 360 and so he took the, the 360 day year and he times it by 483 and he got 173,880 days. Aren't you excited? Okay. Well, it is exciting because we know the trigger date. The trigger date is March 14th, 445 BC. So if you count off 173,880 days, you land on April 6th, 32 AD, the very first Palm Sunday. And that's what we just read about in Luke chapter 19. The very first Palm Sunday. And we're going to see why this is relevant. So let's go back to, to uh, Luke uh, chapter 19. Um, we see that Jesus uh, is weeping over the city. And he has a reason to weep because God gave the Jews the very day that Jesus would present himself as Messiah. But if you, if you look up in uh, a few verses earlier, in verse 38, the people got it, but the leadership of Israel didn't. In verse 38, the, what were the people doing? They were singing this song. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In the, in the book of Matthew, the people were proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying, save us, Jesus, save us, you're God, save us. And the people were celebrating that by saying, blessed is the king, blessed is God who comes in the name of the Lord. But notice what the leadership, what, what position they took. The leadership in verse 39, it shows us that some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd saying, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why? Because these Pharisees thought that Jesus was allowing his disciples to blaspheme because they were calling Jesus God. These Pharisees at this time did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And so to call someone God who was not God in the Jewish world was blasphemy and that was a, that was a capital crime. And so these Pharisees are probably thinking, oh, we got to straighten these people out. But notice what Jesus said in the next verse, verse 40. He said, but he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. This prophecy was going to happen whether the people of Israel or the leaders of Israel recognized it or not. Because if necessary, God would have given mouths to the stones and the stones would have cried out. And you might be saying, come on, pastor, you don't believe that. I absolutely do. Because the God that I believe in can do anything. There is nothing too difficult for him. He's the one that has created all this. He's the one who's created you. He's the one who is calling you to himself. He is the one that is looking at you 
and sees you where you are right now, whether you're a Christian or not, God knows who you are, He knows what you're going through, and He loves you. And He wants to bless you. But He can't bless sin. Jesus, the next point after Jesus pleading, uh, weeping, is that Jesus pleads. In verse 42, look at the pleading of Jesus to the people of Israel at this time. He said, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day. My friends, is this your day? Are some of you out there, is this the first time that you've ever heard the gospel message? You know what the gospel message is? The gospel message is very simple. The gospel message is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. What does that mean? It means that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, if you put your faith in him, okay, you will not go to hell. You won't perish. You will, you will be saved from the lake of fire. And those who do believe will have everlasting life. And not only will you have everlasting life, but Jesus said to his disciples, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So, so eternal life doesn't begin when you die and go to heaven or get raptured and go to heaven. Eternal life begins when you're born again of God's spirit. You say, well, how do you become born again? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. John, in his gospel, John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, this is what John records. It says, and he, who was, he's talking about Jesus, came to, came to his own, which is the Jewish leadership, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe upon him, who are not born by the will of man, nor by the will of God, but born, uh, uh, neither by the will of man, nor by the will of flesh, but born by the will of God. And so what happens when a person comes to Jesus and admits, Jesus, you are God. I believe that you are God. I believe that you can save me from hell. It says what happens is the Holy Spirit is then poured into that person and they become born again. And so we have a saying, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And what that means is if you only have a natural birth and you never accept Jesus Christ into your heart and you die you're going to go to hell and have eternal death. But if you're born again of God, you're, you're going to be born twice. You're going to be born in, your, in the natural and in the supernatural, and you'll never face the second death, which is hell, fire, and brimstone. In fact, you will inherit eternal life, and God will give you abundant life right here, right now, today. Because God sees you. But if you're not one of His, He's weeping over you because you're in big trouble. See, these people, God gave them a specific prophecy. He told them the very day that he would present himself as Messiah. On April 6th, 32 AD, Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem as their Savior, Messiah, and God, and they failed to recognize the time of their visitation. And so Jesus was pleading with them. And the pleading goes like this. He says, um, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that made for your peace. Jesus wants to bring you peace. But if you keep rejecting Jesus, you will not have peace. You can have money. You can have fame. You can have fortune. You can have power and status and political power. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have real peace. Because every one of you know you, we know, instinctively, every human being knows there is a God, there is a heaven, there is a hell, and that we need to find a way to please God. And how do you please God? Well, the Bible tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God. So how do you get faith? Well, the Bible also tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you are hearing a message from God's word telling you how to be saved, how to have peace, how to know God personally. See, I know God personally. I love him. I love him more than anyone or anything. And you know what? He is so faithful. I, sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I let him down. But God has never let me down. God has always been there for me when I've needed him. Now, I may, he doesn't always give me everything I want. 
but he gives me everything I need. And, and so I'm happy with that. I'm content with that. In fact, the Bible says contentment with godliness is means to great gain. And so not only was Jesus wants, wants you to know his plan of salvation, not only does he have a special day for you, and not only does he want to give you peace, he wants you to see and understand the times. Guys, we live in very weird, bizarre times. We got all this globalism going on, and we have a president that has been opposed by a large segment of the American population. We have this battle between good and evil uh, uh, arising where there are those who stand for the rule of law and for the right of those to live, the right of the unborn to live, and those who think that the unborn have no voice, that they're just tissue and should be destroyed, and who do not believe in the rule of law, but that believe in political expediency. We've got people that are that are rising up you know, in, 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 in good ways to help America to team up with the president, to team up with the CDC, to team up with the governors and, and, the, and the mayors to help America get over this coronavirus. And then we have people that are taking advantage, hoarding things and then trying to sell things you know, for extreme prices. I, I was just talking with my friend and, and, and he was telling me that there was a mask on sale on, on eBay for $15,000. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous! Fifteen thousand. It's a hundred dollar mask, and it's being sold for fifteen thousand dollars. Why would you take advantage of your fellow Americans like that? I'll tell you why. Because you love money, and the love of money is the root of all evil. You need to repent. You need whoever that whoever is selling that. You need to take that off and repent. Okay. And that guy that was hoarding toilet paper, you got caught, didn't you? You know why? Because be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Sin has a way of bubbling to the surface. And you know what? The sin of Israel bubbled to the surface because they, it, Jesus came, as was predicted by their prophets, at a specific time. For such a time as this, he came and they failed to recognize the coming of God. Don't you be like the Israelites and fail to recognize God's coming to you. This might be the time where God through his spirit is coming to you, speaking to your spirit saying, yeah, listen to this guy. Understand that Jesus is the son of God. Put your faith in Jesus and you will be saved. You will be born again. You will be made into a new creation. You will be given peace and you'll be given all the promises of eternal life. But not, on, not only did Jesus weep over the, the, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel, not only did he plead for them to come to him and to know, but he also predicted what would happen because of their failure. In verse 43, he says, for day, he, Jesus now begins to prophesy. He says, for the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. My friends, this could be the time of your visitation today on Palm Sunday. Some of you might be watching this on Palm Sunday. Wouldn't it be cool to accept Jesus into your heart on Palm Sunday? Because you know why? Because then you could remember it pretty easily. So, oh yeah, in 2020, during the coronavirus epidemic, I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and became a Christian on Palm Sunday. Okay? Uh, April 5th, 2020. Wouldn't that be cool? Jesus knew that the enemies of Israel would assault them 38 years later. Jesus knows that sometimes our enemies will surround us. And the question is, will we be destroyed by our enemies or will we let Jesus rescue us? And you're saying, well, what are you talking about, Nelson? What did Jesus know about Israel? Well, here's the, here's the historical facts, okay? 38 years after Jesus prophesied over the destruction of Israel, the Roman armies under the command of Titus of Aspasian, Vespasian and the Roman legions went, went into Jerusalem. They conquered the city of Jerusalem. They sacked it. And, they, and the temple ended up catching on fire. And the gold in the temple burned and melted all throughout the city because the temple was at the highest point of the city. And it was, like I said, Jerusalem's on a mountain and everything is sloped. And so all the gold melted out into the streets. And so what the Romans did is they, they turn, overturned every single stone to, to get the gold, just as Jesus predicted. And not only that, but the Romans killed over a million Jewish men, women, and children in a horrific battle 
just as Jesus predicted, because look at what he said. He said that your enemies will surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. What he's saying is they're going to kill you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's very dangerous to fail to recognize the time of God's visitation to you. It can be dangerous physically, but more importantly, it can be dangerous spiritually. Now you might be saying, well, that doesn't sound like a very merciful God predicting the destruction of his own people. What was that all about? Well, guess what? Not of all of his people were a part of this destruction. You see, there was a segment of Jews that lived in Jerusalem that did believe in Jesus. And in 70 AD, when the Romans came in to uh, wipe the city out, there was a lull in the fighting because Caesar had died. And so the Romans had to reorganize their armies and their infrastructure. And so during that lull, the, the Jewish people who were born again Christians, they all snuck away into the mountains as Luke warned them in Luke chapter 21. In fact, we can take a look at that. Luke warned the Christian Jews when he said in Luke chapter 21, uh, verse uh, 20, he says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its des desolation is near. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, and that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And sure enough, the Jewish Christians who believed in Jesus in 70 AD, they fled into the mountains. And Josephus records to us in the book of Antiquities that not one single Christian Jew died in that siege. See, it is important, both physically and spiritually, to understand the time of God's visitation to you. What is Jesus' end goal here? Well, let's go back to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. This is the, 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 the goal of Jesus. And ver, actually, let's read verse 9 for some context. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. What Jesus was talking about was Zac, Zac, uh, Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, despised, despicable tax collector, who was pushed away by the religious authorities and by the uh, religious Jews. But Jesus came into his house, and Zac, Zacchaeus got saved and Jesus said, this is what my goal is, to seek and save that which is lost. Not only that, but in John 11, verse 25, Jesus said, he said this, and he said to an, unto her, unto um, 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 Mary, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. Now, I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. If you're not born again of God's Spirit, you need to get saved today. God wants to seek you out. He sees you. He weeps over you. He weeps over your condition, your sin. He wants to heal you. He wants to save you. So today could be the day of your salvation. So if I were you, I would get on my knees and ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. If I were you, I would admit to God, I am a sinner. You are the Son of God. I believe that Jesus came in the flesh. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose again from the third day. I believe that he ascended to the Father's throne. I believe that he's going to come back one day for his church and take us away and take us out of this world. Because anything else will leave you in the clutches of Satan and hell, fire and brimstone. And you don't want that. You want eternal life, not eternal death. Let's pray. Father, um, I thank you for Palm Sunday. What a, what a wonderful fulfillment of your biblical prophecy. And it shows us that we can trust the Bible, that we can trust the words of Jesus, that we can trust the words of Paul and James and John and Elijah and Moses and Daniel and Zechariah. Father God, we know that these words come from you. These were men that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, they, and the Holy Spirit gave them prophecies centuries before they happened. And we know that Jesus fulfilled over three 
300 Old Testament prophecies. No mere human could do that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He did come to seek and save that which is lost, and only He can bring salvation. And so, Father God, I pray for those in America who need salvation, that they would get saved right now. I pray for those who are sick with coronavirus, that they would get healed right now. I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would sweep across our great land, and that you would do a great work, and that you would bless us from the president on down to every single American. And Lord, I also pray for the world. I pray that you would drive this coronavirus out of the world. I pray that people in the world would get saved, and that you would be glorified in all this. In Jesus' name, amen.